Dear friends in Christ, if you're like me, you have probably observed that there are some people who seem to be obsessed by knowing the future. There are some who read their horoscopes religiously, trying to find out what the future might hold for them as it is dictated by the stars. There are people in the financial world who make a living trying to predict what will happen in the future. And there are Christians who seem to limit their Bible study to those sections of God's Word which addresses what is yet to come. With the future on the minds of so many people, it's always an appropriate time for us as the children of God to ask the question, is heaven in our future? Is heaven in your future? I have no doubt that some of you here today may not be sure. Oh, you're hoping it is. You're keeping your fingers crossed and praying that when the end comes, you will be included in those who get to spend eternity with our Lord Jesus Christ. But when push comes to shove, you're not exactly sure if you're going to make the cut. Is heaven in your future. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the, the answer is a resounding yes. Yes. Without a doubt, absolutely. Heaven is in your future if you belong to Jesus through faith. When our Lord Jesus proclaimed from the cross, it is finished, he assured us that no matter how far we may have wandered away from God. We can't wander so far that our Lord's death and resurrection can't bring us safely back into the Lord's presence and one day into heaven. It means that no matter how deeply we may have offended our Heavenly Father, we cannot offend Him so deeply that His Son's forgiveness from Calvary's cross, can't make things right again. Heaven is in your future because of Jesus and Jesus alone, period. All that needed to be done has been done by Christ our Lord. The Bible makes it very clear that those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And it's because of Jesus that we can have confidence that heaven is in our future. We know that in the church, not just Epiphany, not just in the Lutheran church, but across Christendom, especially in the United States, we have missed basically a generation of people from about 15 years of age to around 29 years of age. Because of that, uh, in our staff meetings, our and also with the elders and the leadership council, we're reading a book called uh, Growing Young and how we can reconnect and claim those people that may have grown up in the church but have just disappeared. And as I was reviewing a chapter for this coming Tuesday for the staff meeting, the author said, you know, people of that age, they're not really concerned about what is to come because they're just too busy living life right now. They want Christianity that speaks to the present to the challenges that they confront today. I would suggest to you, however, that when we stop asking the question, if heaven is in our future, we fail to miss this great blessing that God gives us. What I want to talk to you about the remainder of this message is that because heaven is in our future through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, it has some very practical implications and applications for us as we follow Jesus through this life. Three in particular that I would like to stress. Because heaven is in your future as a child of God, first of all, you can live hopefully. Live hopefully. As you study the book of Acts, as you study early church history, do you know what really impressed unbelievers about the believers who follow Jesus Christ? It was the fact that those who followed Jesus Christ really were different people. 
they sometimes suffered terribly at the hands of unbelievers. And yet even in their suffering, even in their persecution, they never lost their hope. They described what was yet to come as if it had already arrived. And indeed, in one respect, we could say it had. You see, when they went through the trials of life, when they experienced persecution, in spite of how horrible it was at times, they still maintained that God was in control. And through it all, he was working out his plan for the welfare of his children. God was in control, and because of the fact that God was in control, a greater life awaited them. They had, in the words of our text, hope. And their hope put everything into perspective. Everything. Listen again to the words of our text. Paul said, I consider that the present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. When the Bible talks about hope, it's not as we often talk about hope. We use the word hope as wishful thinking. Oh, I hope I win the lottery. Oh, uh, I hope the Detroit Lions win the Super Bowl. And that's even weirder than trying to win the lottery, isn't it? You know, I hope, and it's just wishful thinking. There's no conviction, and the chances of it happening are few and far between. That's not how the Bible uses the word hope as it applies to you and I as we live our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. The hope that Paul says that we can have right now is a firm confidence. It is a certainty because of what has already been done for us through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Everything that Jesus did, he did for you and for me. When he died, he died for us. When he rose again, he rose again for us so that we could live in confidence that there's nothing that will ever come into our lives that is bigger than God himself who has promised to be with us and to hold us and at times carry us through this life until that day that all things are made new. That is the hope that Paul says we can have. And that is a hope that really does change attitudes and change lives. So much so that Paul would write to people who were suffering and say, if God is for us, who can be against us? Or the John Solomon and paraphrased version, if God is for us, who cares who's against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, Give us all things. My friends, if you've ever wondered what in the world does that mean, let me explain it to you the best that I know how. God will give you everything you need for this life. And when you need it most, he will be there for you, and there will be nothing that you lack that you need in order to keep walking the life of faith. There is no trial, there is no tribulation, there is no persecution, there is no setback that is greater than God's love and presence in your life. And he will see you through it all until that day that you get to see him face to face when he comes again in glory. That is the hope that the Christians had in the early church. That is the hope that Paul says we can have today and it's a certainty because of what Christ has done for us. That's the first thing. There's a practical application. Because heaven is in our future, we can live with hope. But secondly, because Christ has put heaven in our future, we can live responsibly. Responsibly. To live responsibly means one thing, biblically speaking. It is to love. To love God first and other people second. To love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our minds, with all of our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's what Jesus said. And Jesus also told us that this would be the mark of someone who is a follower of Jesus Christ. He said, by this all men will know that you are my followers, my disciples, if you love one another. Several years ago, 
Many homeless people rode the trains rather than lived under overpasses like they so often do today. The people were called hobos. And they would hop a train, and it would take them wherever, and they would float around that town for a little while, and then they'd hop on another train and move on with their life. And the hobos had a system that they would mark a fence so that other hobos would know if the people that they go went to for food would be accommodating or not. And they just marked the fence so that they would find a good reception. And so it was that a certain hobo came to a house that, whose fence had been marked, and he knocked on the door and he asked the owner for food. The man who answered the door said that if the hobo would come to the back door, he would give him a sandwich to eat. And the hobo went around the back of the house, knocked on the door, and there was the man with a freshly made sandwich. And as he was giving it to the hobo, he said, Before you eat, I would like to have prayer with you. Please repeat after me, Our Father who art in heaven. And the hobo said, Your Father who art in heaven. And the man said, No, no, you, you weren't listening. Say the prayer just as I say it. Our Father who art in heaven. And the hobo said, Your Father who art in heaven. And the man said again, you're not listening. It's our father, not your father. And the hobo said, no, sir, I think you're the one who's not listening and doesn't get it. I can't believe it's our father because I don't think dad would want you to send me to the back of the house as if you were ashamed to help your brother. That hobo got it right. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a responsibility. Because heaven is in our future, we have a responsibility to not live just for the here and the now, but to live for things eternal. And that means to reach out in love to those around us, especially to those who have need. And sometimes we forget that truth. Sometimes we think that Christianity and the blood of Jesus, which washes away sin, is meant for a select group, for us good people here in church. It's not true. The good news is Jesus' love, Jesus' blood, was shed and is given to all people. It's meant for black and white, rich and poor, uneducated and educated, unemployed and employed. The blood of Jesus Christ was shed for all people. And because of that, the church, historically at least, has always taken seriously the responsibility to live a life of love to other people so that they too might experience the love of Jesus Christ through his body, the church. We are called to live responsibly. Because Christ has made heaven a part of our future. He has opened the doors of eternity wide to us. And in so doing, all the blessings of heaven are also given to us as a gift. And because of that, the Spirit moves us to want to be involved and make a difference. The Spirit moves us to long to be the compassionate people that Jesus is to us. Because heaven is in our future, we are compelled to share our blessings with others. We're called to live responsibly. And thirdly, because heaven is in our future, it means that we can live expectantly. A little boy was about to celebrate his fifth birthday. All week long, he'd been asking his mom, is today my birthday? And she would say patiently, it's not here yet. But his mother kept assuring the little boy that his birthday was coming. The little boy got discouraged, however, because it didn't come quite as quickly as he had wanted. He was excited, and he would get frustrated, because he knew that when his birthday finally arrived, good things awaited him. You know, I share that with you, because that is exactly how we can view the second coming of Jesus Christ. As we get closer to the day that our Lord returns, quite honestly, it causes anxiety for a lot of people. As 
Some grow older and closer to the day that they will meet the Lord. They become fearful. And they try to regain youthful bodies and youthful minds and youthful attitudes. And quite bluntly, many people hate the idea of getting older because it confronts them with their own mortality. Paul reminds us, since we're strangers here, this is not our true home, we don't have to be bogged down with this idea that we're getting older or that when Jesus Christ comes, we need to be afraid of that event. Paul reminds us that we can live expectantly like that little boy who eagerly was waiting for his birthday. We can look forward to the day that the trumpet blasts, and it will one day. And we are gathered in the clouds of heaven before the throne of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we are ushered in to that eternity that is blissful beyond our ability to comprehend. And it is a bliss that will never end. It's on that day that we will go into the new heaven and the new earth, as the book of Revelation explains it. And we will experience in reality what John says is a place where God is dwelling with his people. And there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things, the broken world in which we live, that have, will have passed away forever and we will live in the presence of God. That's what is waiting for us because heaven is in our future. And that's the reason that we can get excited about living each and every day knowing that God is working out his plan in our lives and in this world. So that when he comes, we will be ready. So that when he comes, there will be other people who are ready because you and I who receive the love and forgiveness of Jesus didn't just hoard it, but freely shared it everywhere we went. Let me ask you one more time. Is heaven in your future? If it is, and my friends, there is no reason it can't be, then you can live hopefully and you can live responsibly, and you can live expectantly. Live life to the glory of God, to the well-being of others. In Jesus' name, amen.